Hello there, Town Church. We are so glad that you are joining us today for worship. Whether you're watching on our Facebook, on our YouTube, or on our website, I want to encourage you to follow, to like, subscribe, check back, see what's going on in the life of the church. If this is your first time joining us, we say welcome, and we want to connect with you. You can go to our website, www.town.church, slash connect, and inside there's a connect card for you to fill out so that we can connect with you. Today, we continue our series about the Last Supper as we dig into why it is called the Lord's Supper. We hope you are blessed and encouraged by that. Join me after the message as I'll have a few more announcements for you today. church. Amen. I'm not sure if you know this, but it has been statistically proven that women live longer than men. For instance, here in America, if you're a man, your average age of life is 76 years old. If you're a woman living in America, your average age is 81. So statistics have proven, you can look at the CDC statistics, they prove that women live longer than men. Now, I have a theory why that is the case. I mean, you know men, I know men. Many men have an ego. Many men have pride. 
And I want to show you some pictures as to why I think women live longer than men. Now, as you view these pictures and you get a chuckle at the recklessness and the carelessness of these men climbing up ladders and trying to perform different jobs and not being safe and not being careful, maybe this is one of the reasons why women live longer than men. Now, looking at, this, at these pictures, you might think, did this really happen? Would a guy really do this? Well, I've been around guys long enough to believe, yes, I think some guys would try some of these feats. And so, sure enough, women live longer than men. And I think one of the reasons is pride. But I'll tell you, pride is not just a man thing. Pride can also be a woman thing. Pride is a human thing. And many of us, if we're not careful, we can succumb to pride. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about Peter's pride. We're going to look at a story about the apostle Peter and how Jesus predicted that he would deny Christ three times and yet Peter protested and said, no, 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 others may deny you, but I won't. He had pride. And as we talk today about pride, I'm talking specifically about pride in this sense, an exaggerated and misplaced confidence in one's own strength or judgment. I'm talking about a self-confidence, and not just any type of self-confidence, an exaggerated self-confidence, a misplaced self-confidence, where you're trusting in yourself rather than in the Lord. That's what I mean today when I'm talking about pride. We see that pride in the Apostle Peter. I think at times we see that pride in ourselves, and that type of pride always leads to a spiritual stumble. It led to a stumble in Peter's life, and it will lead to a stumble in your life unless you humble yourselves and put aside your pride. And so if you have a Bible today, if you have a New Testament today, I'd like for you to take it and turn over to Mark chapter 14, and I want to read verses 26 through 31. And so you've already had the episode of the Last Supper where Jesus has gathered with his disciples during the time of the Passover. And in that time, he has introduced what we know as the Lord's Supper. And we talked about that last week. And that leads right into the prediction of Peter's denial. Jesus has already predicted the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. Now he's predicting the, the denial of the apostle Peter. So look with me beginning in verse 26. It says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Right there's his pride. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. I think it's so evident when you look at this story, and as I read this story to you, to see the pride of Peter. And you know, at times we have that pride in our life. And when I'm talking about pride today, I'm talking about that exaggerated and misplaced self-confidence where we think that we can do it, where we think we're beyond a stumble, where we think maybe that we're better than other people or stronger than other people. Uh, Peter said, even though everyone else denies you, even though everyone else falls away, I won't. I'll stand true, Lord. That's the pride of Peter. And I want to talk about that pride today because if you want to have a spiritual stumble, if you want to have a spiritual disaster in your life, then let pride have its way into your heart. Let pride have its way into your life. And yet we don't want that type of disaster. We don't want that type of stumble. We want to stay close to the Lord. 
We want to live a life of integrity. We want to do right before the Lord. We want to honor the Lord. And therefore, we need humility in our life. Our trust is not to be in ourselves. Our trust is to be in the Lord. And so as we think about this passage today, I want you to ask yourself, is pride present in my life? And you know, most people don't think that they're proud. I would say if you ask most people, even someone that you look at and say, that's a very proud person, that's a very arrogant person, I think if you were to ask them, they would probably say to you, oh, I'm not a proud person. I think most of us don't think that we're, we're, we're prideful. I think most of us think that, hey, we are pretty humble and we're not arrogant, we're not conceited. Sometimes we don't see the pride in our own life. And so I want to ask you today to kind of look at your life in light of this a stumble of the Apostle Peter, in light of these words to the Apostle Peter. I want you to look at your life and ask yourself, is pride present in my life? Because it's important to detect it now, before that spiritual stumble, before that spiritual disaster, to detect it now so that you can cast it off and humble yourself before the Lord so that you can avoid any type of stumble before the Lord. And so I want to be talking today about pride. I want to be talking today about this misplaced self-confidence and try to help us see when is this type of pride present in our life. And so the first thing I want to say to you is this. Pride is present when we don't accept who Christ says we are. Do you want to know if pride is present in your life? Well, it's present when we don't accept who Christ says we are. You know, Christ may say to us, this is who you are, or this is an area where you need to improve, or this is an area in your life that needs to change, and yet we may protest and say, oh, that's not the case. No, no, I'm better than you think I am. I'm stronger than you think I am. I don't really need to change in that area. Pride is present when we don't accept who Christ says we are. If you look again in this passage in verses 27 and 28, Jesus said, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up... I will go before you to Galilee. Peter uh, heard Jesus say to him, and really all of the disciples heard Jesus say to them, that you will all fall away. He said this. He said it's even written that this would happen. It was written in the Old Testament as a prophecy that this would take place. You will all fall away. And yet Peter said, not me. The others might fall away. The others might deny you. Lord, these other disciples may not be true and may not be strong, but I will. I will stand true. I will not deny you. I will even die with you if I have to. You see, Peter did not accept the word of Christ. He did not accept who Christ said he was. He thought he was someone else. He did not have a good estimate of himself. He thought he was one person, and Jesus said, no, you're another person. And that's when pride is present, when we don't accept who Christ says we are. And let me tell you, pride cuts both ways. Because in these verses that I read, Jesus not only predicted their stumble and their desertion, but he also predicted their restoration. You see, he predicted their stumble... He said, you will all fall away. But he also predicted their restoration. He said, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. After my resurrection, you're going to be restored. You're going to be near me again. You're going to repent. So he not only predicted their stumble, he also predicted their restoration. You see, pride cuts both ways. Pride can say, I don't need help. But pride can also say, I'm beyond help. 
Pride can say I'm, a, I'm good enough, but pride can also say I'm too bad. You see, you can have pride in your life, and when Jesus says to you, you will all fall away, like Peter, you can say, oh, not me. I'm stronger than that. Other disciples may stumble. Other disciples may fall, but not me. And so that's how pride can show itself, that you think that you don't need help. You don't accept who Christ says you are. But pride can also reveal itself when you think you're beyond help. Because let me tell you here, Christ, he predicts also their restoration. And so you could be out here today and you could be listening online and you might be nearing a spiritual stumble. And there may be pride in your life, a misplaced self-confidence in your own abilities, in your own judgment, in the decisions that you're making. And Christ may be warning you about that. And in your pride, you think, I don't need help. That's not who I am. And so pride can reveal itself in that way. But on the flip side, you may be someone who has already stumbled. You have already fallen. And you have fallen miserably before the Lord. And Christ is saying, I can restore you. I can forgive you. I can help you. And yet there can be a pride there too where you think, not that you don't need help, you might think, I'm beyond help. I can never be in a right relationship with the Lord again. I can never be forgiven. I can never be restored. Why not? Christ can restore you. Christ has restored so many. So many of his followers have deserted him at times, have failed him at times, and yet when they have confessed their sins and asked him for forgiveness, he is a forgiving, loving, merciful Savior. And so some, their pride says, I don't need help. Others, their pride says, I'm beyond help. But we need to accept who Christ says we are. I remember as a teenager, when I was battling addiction and abusing alcohol and getting in trouble with the law and had a bad relationship with my parents and my grades were suffering at school, on a particular Sunday evening, I was arrested and I was arrested for public intoxication, disorderly conduct, and resisting arrest. I don't even remember it. I had blacked out in my drunken, intoxicated stupor. I don't remember any of this. And yet I was arrested, and I was placed in the detention center there in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. And while I was in there, I was angry for being in there. I wanted to get out, and I had pride in my life. But I remember on one particular evening, I was in the room alone. My roommate had not come in yet. He was still out in the foyer and playing games or whatever they were doing, watching TV. And I was in the room by myself. And the Lord visited me that night. It wasn't like I saw him with my physical eyes or heard him audibly. But let me tell you, the Lord visited me that night. And it was like he placed a mirror right in front of me. And said, this is who you are. This is who you have become. This is how far you have fallen. You see, I was raised in the church. I was baptized at a young age. I had memorized the books of the Bible and recited them before the congregation. And now I'm a drug addict. And now I'm one abusing alcohol and getting arrested and and, and hated my parents and wasn't doing well in school. And it was like the Lord took a mirror and he put it right in front of me. And he said, this is who you have become. And I began to weep. I had not wept in a long time. I began to weep before the Lord. And I was humbled. That was not the moment of my conversion. But that was the journey back. If you've ever read the story about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15... There's that powerful verse where it says, but he came to himself. And it was like that night I came to myself and I realized who I was and, and I realized how far I had fallen and I began to journey back home. And eventually on September 23rd, 1990, I was converted and cleansed of my sins and I was made a new person in Jesus Christ. But it began when I saw myself 
in a way that Christ said, this is who you are. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? You see, most people don't want to admit pride. We want to think, hey, we're good people and we're, we're beyond a spiritual stumble. We want to think better of ourselves than at times we really are. And pride can say, I don't, want to, I don't want to accept Christ's verdict of who I am. And yet humility says, I need his help. I'm not beyond a spiritual stumble. I need the grace of God every day, every hour, every minute. That's what humility says. You see, we're not as strong as we think we are, and we're not as good as we think we are. And as I often say, if there's anything good in me, God gets the praise. And if there's anything bad in me, I get the blame. God gets all the glory. I get all the blame. And so pride is present when we don't accept who Christ says we are. And who are we? Apart from Christ and apart from his grace, our heart is sinful and our heart is desperately wicked. That's why we need substitutionary atonement. That's why we need Jesus to die in our place. And you see that in those verses. Jesus quotes from Zechariah chapter 13. And the way Jesus phrases it is this, I will strike the shepherd. If you go back in the Hebrew or you go back in the Greek Septuagint, it just says strike the shepherd. But when Jesus is quoting this passage, he says, I will strike the shepherd. And who is speaking there? The Lord God Almighty. Who is the shepherd? Jesus and the Lord God Almighty says, I will strike the shepherd. God strike Jesus? That doesn't seem to make sense. Why would that happen? Because Jesus died in our place. Jesus faced the judgment of God. Jesus faced the wrath of God so that we don't have to. We can be forgiven not because we're good people. We can go to heaven, not because we're good people, but because we're forgiven. And we're forgiven based on the substitutionary death of Jesus. God the Father says, I will strike the shepherd. The shepherd didn't do anything wrong. Jesus was sinless. And yet he suffered on the cross for your sins and for my sins so that we could be forgiven. Pride is present when we don't accept who Christ says we are. Well, second, pride is present when we think we can stand in our own strength. You see this with the Apostle Peter. In verses 29 and 31, he says, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And then it says, And he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And yet if you read on in the gospel of Mark, you realize he did deny Christ. Just as Jesus said, he did deny Christ. A servant girl came up to him and said, aren't you one of Jesus' followers? I can tell you have a Galilean accent. Aren't you one of his followers? And Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know the man. No, I'm not a follower of Jesus. And sure, and sure enough, just as Jesus said, Peter denied him three times. You see, pride is present when we think we can stand in our own strength. Peter thought he was unique. He said, yeah, the others may fall away, but I won't. I'll be the one who stands I'll be the one who's loyal. I'll be the one who's faithful. And yet he stumbled and he denied Christ three times. He wasn't trusting in the Lord's strength. You say, how do you know? Well, after this passage, you have the story about the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to join him in prayer 
as Jesus prayed, knowing that the cross was looming before him, praying for strength, praying for grace to face the cross, and he asked the disciples to watch with him for one hour. And instead of praying, what did Peter do? He fell asleep. That shows me that his confidence was not in the Lord, but in himself. And that's why Jesus said in verse 38, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, Jesus said, you need to pray, Peter. I'm facing the cross, but you're facing the temptation to deny me three times. Peter, you need to pray. And Peter, instead of praying, he was sleeping. You know, prayer says, I'm depending on God. Prayer says I'm weak in and of myself. Prayer says unless God helps me, I won't be able to stand. Instead of praying, Peter was sleeping. Jesus said the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Let me tell you, in your life, your spirit may be willing. You may have that desire to do right, but your flesh is weak. That's why we need the strength of the Lord. That's why we need regular times of prayer. I don't know how important prayer is in your life. I don't know how important prayer is in your family. But on a daily basis, on a regular basis, we need to be engaged in times of prayer because we need the strength of the Lord. You see, pride is present when we think we can stand In our own strength. I remember a friend of mine, and he too had a problem with drug addiction, and his was worse than mine, and he got involved in all types of drugs and actually got pretty involved in cocaine abuse. And I remember as he was trying to put that aside, and he had become sober, and he hadn't used for some time. He told me that he was going to go back to a cocaine dealer's house. And I said, why are you going there? You're not using again, are you? He said, no, I'm not using. But he said, I want to go back to that cocaine house. And I want to walk in there. And I want to look at that dealer and all the different ones there just to prove to myself that I don't need that anymore. And I told him, I said to him, that's foolish. Why would you do such a thing? You don't need to prove anything to them. You don't need to prove anything to yourself. Let me tell you, that was pride. That was pride in him saying, hey, I can go and I can face this situation again and and it won't cause me to stumble. I can tell you this, after I got converted, I was so careful, and I'm still careful, but particularly after I was first converted. I remember when I would go to the grocery store, In most grocery store, they'll have a whole aisle or most of an aisle dedicated to alcohol. And I would hardly even go down those aisles. And if I had to walk down, I wouldn't even look to my right or to my left. And it wasn't that I wanted to use, and it wasn't that I thought I would stumble, but I just wanted to be careful. I wanted to be careful and not not allow myself to, to fall spiritually. You see, you're not as strong as you think you are. I'm not as strong as I think I am. And sometimes pride will slip in, and we feel like, oh, I can do this, and I can face any situation. Yeah, the others will deny Christ, but not me. I'll even die with Christ if I have to. Our faith should not be in our own strength. Our faith should be in the Lord. And so let me ask you, how's your prayer life? If you don't pray much, I guarantee you pride is present. Because if you have pride in your life, you'll think, I don't need the Lord. I don't need his strength. But when you're humble before the Lord, you're going to be praying on a regular basis. Well, let me, let me give you one other time when pride is present in your life. Third, Pride is present when we don't realize how quickly and how far we can stumble. You see this in the, in the life of the Apostle Peter. 
In verse 30, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. You see, pride is present when we don't realize how quickly or how far we can stumble. You see, Peter was following the Lord. Peter had left all to follow Christ. He had left his fishing business to follow Christ. He had left all, and he was following the Lord. And yet Jesus said, this very night, how quickly Peter stumbled. This very night. And then he also said, you will deny me three times. How far Peter stumbled to actually deny Christ. Peter thought, there's no way I would ever deny Christ. And yet he did it that very night, and he did it three times, and he did it before a servant girl. You see, pride is present when we don't realize how, how quickly and how far we can stumble. Do you know that you can be living a godly life and you can be faithful and you can be consistent and yet in a moment of weakness, in a moment of unguarded weakness, you can stumble and you can stumble quickly and you can stumble far and you can tarnish your reputation. You can tarnish your ministry, and you can tarnish the influence upon your family, your friends, your co-workers. When pride gets in there, this misplaced, exaggerated self-confidence, let me tell you, it leads to a spiritual stumble. And that's what happened with the apostle Peter. He denied Christ three times. Why? Because he had pride. And he wasn't humble before the Lord. I think about that story in the Old Testament about David and Bathsheba. And you have King David. He was a man after God's own heart. He was the king. He had faced Goliath in that battle with five smooth stones and a sling and had defeated that giant. He was a great warrior. He was a poet. He was a psalm writer. A man of God respected the people, loved David. And he was the king over all of Israel. And yet on one particular day, instead of going out the, to battle, he remained there in his palace. And he was looking out upon the city. And he noticed this very attractive woman. And she was bathing. And she was naked. And instead of saying, oh, no, I don't need to look at this and turning away and going back inside and asking God to cleanse his mind. He looked and he looked and he looked and he lusted in his heart and he said, I've got to have that woman. And he called for her and she came and they slept together that night and he, he released her to go back home. And then she sent word and said, I'm pregnant. And instead of right there humbling himself and confessing his wrongs, he called her husband because she was a married woman. Her husband was Uriah the Hittite, and he was in battle, in battle for David and for Israel. And he called Uriah back to town, and he tried to get him to sleep with his wife so that Uriah would think the baby was his. They didn't have DNA testing back then. And yet Uriah wouldn't do it. He said, I'm not going to sleep with my wife while my fellow soldiers are in the battle. And so David thought, what am I going to do? And so he actually gets him intoxicated. He gives Uriah all this alcohol, and he drinks and he drinks until he's drunk. And even then, he refuses to sleep with his wife. And so what does David do then? He says, i got to have this man killed. And he writes a letter to Joab, the general. And basically in this letter, he said, I want you to put Uriah at the front of the battle. I want him killed. He sealed it. He closed the letter. He sealed it. 
And Uriah himself had to take that letter to Joab, and he didn't know he was carrying his own death sentence, thought he was serving David, and yet David wanted him killed. And that's what happened. Uriah the Hittite died, and then David called for Bathsheba, and she came. She was pregnant. And yet the Lord saw all of this. The Lord saw the pride of David's heart and sent Nathan the prophet who said, you are the man. You have fallen. You have stumbled. And he did forgive David. God did forgive David. But he also faced temporal judgments. That child died, and many other things happened in David's family. There were consequences for his sinful actions. And yet the Lord did forgive him. But think about how far and how quickly David fell. Man after God's own heart. Writing psalms in the Bible. King of Israel. Mighty warrior. Respected by the people. And then he fell in an unguarded moment of weakness. He fell. And he faced a lot of negative consequences. Let me tell you, pride goes before a fall. Pride precedes a spiritual disaster. And pride is present, my friends, when we don't realize how quickly and how far we can stumble. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. You may be listening today and say, hey, I'm good, pastor. I'm close to the Lord. I'm good. I don't have to worry about this. Well, David didn't think he had to worry about it. And Peter didn't think he had to worry about it. I love how honest the Bible is. David is our hero. Peter is our hero and yet the Bible's so honest about their weaknesses, failures, shortcomings, and stumbles. If David could fall, you and I could fall. If Peter could stumble, you and I could stumble. So how do we overcome? We put aside our pride. We humble ourselves before the Lord. We watch and pray. And the Lord will give us strength. And the Lord will preserve and protect us from all evil. I'm encouraging you today to humble yourself before the Lord. Trust in his strength and not in your own strength. Would you bow with me for a prayer? Lord, we thank you for these stories in the Bible that remind us of who we are and what we need. And, Lord, we need your strength. Maybe we also need your forgiveness. And so where forgiveness is needed, may you grant it. Where strength is needed, may you provide it. And, Lord, I pray you would help us to put aside pride, to be humble before you, and to avoid a spiritual disaster. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so glad that you have joined us today for worship. We hope that you are blessed and encouraged by the message today. If you feel you need prayer or if you have a question, we would love to pray for you. We would love to answer your questions. You can go to our website, www.town.church connect or down in the video description, there's a link for this. We'd love to pray for you that way. We also thank you so much for your tithes and offering. We hope that you continue doing that online at www.town.church invest. And again, the link is down in the video description. Well, whether you're watching on our Facebook, we encourage you to follow, to like, subscribe. And until we see you again next week, God bless.